Hello, my name is Professor Steve Miller, and today in our class on Introduction to CFD, Computational Fluid Dynamics, we'll be looking at the special topic of, of course, combustion. In particular, we'll look at computational combustion. We'll review how the equations, the Navier-Stokes equations, are modified to take into account reacting flow. In our previous classes, we are looking at special topics. In this particular class, we will look at the particular combustion equations, some classifications of flames and of turbulence too, reacting turbulence. We'll look at some particular computational approaches. And we'll look at some examples. The work shown in this class is by, and shown in the book, Theoretical and Numerical Combustion from my copy in 2016. This is an excellent book, and it's not too much money, and this author has also, of course, made his own online classes of combustion itself. I highly recommend looking at Poinceau's combustion work. He's an internationally famous author. I'm just showing some snippets of the major ideas so you can understand how what we've learned in the CFD class can be applied and modified for combustion. It's mainly a mathematical work in that we have to introduce these new types of equations. And so let's introduce very briefly and quickly the concept of combustion equations. I'll hit the major points, but I hope that you can pause the video to read through these particular slides, which I made based on the book of, of course, Poinceau and his colleagues. Now combustion will resolve multiple species which are reacting and through multiple chemical reactions. We'll introduce the idea of a mass fraction, y sub k, where n is the number of species of the reaction mixture. We'll define the mass fraction this way, where it's the fraction of mass of a particular species k of the chemical reaction. Here mk will be the mass of the species k in a particular volume. We're still now solving for the density, the three variables of the components of the velocity, one energy term. You'll recognize these as the Navier-Stokes equations, but they have to be written and taken into account the mass fractions from a chemical reaction. We also have to take into account equations or set equations for each mass fraction yk for n reacting species. Therefore, in a classic computational combustion problem using CFD of a reacting flow, we'll have typically n plus 5 unknown variables. n can easily be 50 or 60 for a simple hydrocarbon, or it could be, say, 5 or 6,000 for a fully resolved combustion engine and a typical fuel. So it can be very, very large number of equations, and the computational problems are often intractable. Let's just look at our major equations. We'll now have to redefine our pressure and gas laws, and we can have very complicated gas laws. We would now write our pressure on a species basis with sub k, and we would have to rewrite our molecular weights as 1 over w of the sum of over the species k from yk over wk. We can now define two other types of fractions, the mole fraction and the molar concentration fraction. These are respectively the ratio of the number of moles of the species k in volume v to the total number of moles in the same volume and the number of moles in species k per unit volume. Based on these new quantities we have to redefine the way our energy is defined because of course now we have a type of chemical energy and its associated reactions, the heat released from the reactions and the stored chemical energy, all these things, they must now be accounted for. We have our traditional sensible energy which we've modified with now the fractions and we have now a sensible and chemical energy which is also defined to contain the energy of course of the potential enthalpy at the formation of the species K at temperature T. This is what we call this delta H F naught K for each species K. Enthalpy of formation. So there's new kinds of energies that we have to track and account for that are tied both into the momentum and energy equations. We can now define the species enthalpy of each enthalpy H sub K. The algo is now C sub PK times DT plus the delta H F naught, the chemical, of course, um, mass enthalpy of species, K. So we've introduced a new enthalpy now. We can then combine and convert between the particular quantities as I've shown here. You'll also notice we've altered our usual coefficient C sub P, which we've looked at as a constant through our whole CFD class. But now in a reacting flow that is one that has chemical reactions, it will have a different and particular C sub P for each value of the species K. This greatly complicates the problem. 
for each species K, we might have a different value, a CP, when you might have, say, hundreds of species or thousands, which is not abnormal. We would also redefine our heat capacity this way and reform our enthalpy and internal energies. Poinceau and his contemporaries define the sensible, sensible chemical, total chemical, and total non-chemical energies in this way. There's new non-dimensional numbers, like the Lewis number. The Lewis number will define a diffusion coefficient, a species K, and it will be the heat diffusivity constant. We'll call that number lambda. We'll also define the Prandtl number. It's exactly like it was earlier in this class. It's nothing but mu times CP over lambda. The Schmidt number will be uh, the Prandtl number times, of course, the Lewis number. So these three non-dimensional parameters beyond the Reynolds number and Mach number are also non-dimensional, of course, in reacting flow equations. We also have particular um, chemical kinetic equations like you example have seen in chemistry, like I've shown here at the bottom of page 7. One of the most important quantities in CFD and combustion as a field, if you take in the combustion class, is equivalence ratio. And that will be, of course, the ratio, the stoichiometric ratio, times the, the fraction of fuel divided by the fraction of oxygen or oxygenator. Rich combustion, a rich process, will be where the fuel is in excess and lean combustion will be where the oxidizer is in excess. So the equivalence ratio is often defined when talking about experiments. Now we'll need to modify our equations to contain the effect of these chemical reactions. Let's define and modify our first equation, the Navier-Stokes equation, the conservation of mass. It's now written in this form. And you'll notice now that we have the density times the mass fraction of species K. So we have N, that is N species, conservation of mass equations. We can also modify this equation now to the Navier-Stokes equations, that is, to account for, of course, the mass fractions, etc., of each velocity component of the diffusion velocity of Vk. So they all have their own particular diffusion velocities now, in a sense, a species K, and they all have their particular reaction rates. Omega dot sub k is the reaction rate of species k. This will be found in the momentum part of the Navier-Stokes equations. The left-hand side remains the same. Partial rho partial t plus partial rho ui partial xi will be equal to negative partial partial xi of rho times vk yk plus the sum of the reaction rate will be equal to zero. We can greatly simplify the diffusion velocities, which are found by solving this particular system of equations. We redefined x sub k now. x sub k will be the mass fraction with, of course, w over wk, the molecular weight fractions. We now have a linear system of n squared equations. We can try and simplify this, which is the usual approach using fixed law or the so-called Hirschfelder-Curtis approximations. This will give us, instead of solving the system, the fixed law equation, which is shown in the middle of the page. Most of the simulations used will use a Hirschfeld curtis approximation in contemporary CFD of reacting flows. We then can form a differential equation for each reacting species, which is shown right here. You can now see that we have indeed formed a particular set of equations of momentum, energy, mass, fractions, etc., which close a system with an ideal gas law to solve for a reacting flow. But we would need, of course, to know something about the reaction rates and the mass fractions. This is found, of course, through the process of chem chemical combustion chemistry, which is its own particular field and subfield of chemistry. Typically, the combustion chemists and the people in combustion reacting CFD work very closely to tie in the reaction rate models with the actual chemistry of a reacting flow. Each particular type of reacting flow and fuel will need its own set of reaction rates and coefficients. Now we can classify flames into four categories, and this is from Poinceau's book. On the upper left you show laminar flames, which are premixed, and the lower left, you have non premix flames. In fact, a lower left flame, of course, is just your typical lighter for, let's say, a cigarette. In the upper left, you might have a Bunsen burner like you used in a chemistry class. They're both laminar flames. And laminar and turbulent flow are those which we discussed at length in this class. One is classified as highly, highly chaotic, and the other one is very smooth and laminar. 
In the upper right, you see the same type of premix flow, which is turbulent. In the lower right, you see a non-premix flow. Premix flows are where the fuel and oxidizer are mixed together before the reaction takes place. A non-premix flow means that the fuel and oxidizer are separate, and they're mixed within the flow, of course, as the reaction occurs. So, for example, the turbulent jet flame is a non-premix flow, and the flow behind a bluff body, which is stabilized, this is where the reaction occurs, and there's a bluff body from the flow from bottom to top, only occurs behind it, and it's stable. So you can classify most combustion problems in our field of aerospace engineering into one of these four categories. Of course, it's true that the combustion process itself is extremely complicated, if not as complicated as the process of turbulence. And when you combine the two, it makes a very difficult field involving a range of chemical time and length scales. In fact, the chemical scales are much, much smaller than the Kolmogorov scales. And so to fully resolve a turbulent flow of combustion, we would have to have an even wider range of scales and resolution, which create an even more intense computational problem. We try and model these, and then we've introduced these types of models of the reactions into the equations of motion so that we can, of course, reduce this computational cost. Turbulence remains the most complicated part of the reacting or non-reacting flow problems, but unfortunately the turbulence itself, of course, is going to change because of the reactions, and we don't necessarily understand the effect of chemical reactions on turbulence itself. Now, the Turbulent combustion itself will also result when reactions occur in a turbulent flow, and it is modified by the combustion, and combustion will modify turbulence, and turbulence will modify combustion. It's very complicated in a nonlinear two-way street. We can look at particular cases of, say, premix flames. Here's a figure, which is borrowed from Wheeler and Lafitte. In this case, we show how statistical one mesh premix flames propagate within turbulent flow. And so on one side we have fresh gas, on the other side we have burnt gas, and there's a flame front with some particular thickness. In this particular reaction, there'll be a flame speed which propagates down the particular front, or perhaps flame tube, if this was an experiment. Now the total combustion will be dependent on, of course, the turbulent intensity. It's a great example where the turbulence is tied into the combustion. The combustion rate, that is the rate at which the reaction occurs, will be maximum when the fuel and oxidizer are in stoichiometric proportions. That is exactly when there's a balance between fuel and oxidizer. And it will increase when the flow is turbulent. So turbulence actually often increases the rate of burning. So this can be used for specific purposes, of course, in engineering. Here we have another example where we have a turbulent jet which is diffused. Now, on the experiment on the left, we have fuel coming through a little pipe, and it emerges into the ambient air, like in the room. And this is, of course, what we call a non-premix problem. Here, there'll be a flame front on, of course, the edge of the flame. So, of course, the reaction is occurring in this region. There'll be some particular flame length, just like jets have a coral length. And this is very much like a turbulent jet problem for a non-premix flame. The flow comes from left to right, it becomes laminar, and transitions to turbulence, it becomes fully turbulent. So far, we have just briefly touched the iceberg that we've shown you the main idea of how the equations are modified. We've shown you the idea between the different types of combustion flows in a couple examples. And now let's just talk about different classifications for computational combustion. They fall into three major categories. The first is RANDs. And so we would take these combustion equations and Reynolds average them or Fabry average them. They would also require their own unique turbulence closures, but they very closely mirror those, of course, of the one and two equations closures that we talked about at length in this class. We also might consider the large eddy simulation category. This is the most popular computational technique for reacting flows and combustion. It, again, resolves the largest scales of turbulence. It's unsteady, and of course, it's mostly used for research and industrial applications today. But they're basically filtering the equations which we, of reactions that we showed in this class just now. And of course, the last case is Dorotian numerical simulation, which does no filtering at all relative to the other two cases. This is simply, again, once again, for peer research. So DNS with reactions is a very, very small field, and it's very, very expensive and complicated.
relative to the other two types of CFD. So if you're in CFD, you want to do reaction flows. If you want to do a cheap and quick way, you'll do RANDs. And if you want to do something complicated where you're resolving the scales of motion, you'll do large eddy simulation. Let's look at three particular examples of RANDs, LES, and DNS for reacting flows and their advantages and disadvantages. These are again from Poinsot's book. He writes that the advantages are that, well, you'll have a coarser numerical grid, which is good because it'll be cheaper to solve. You'll have simpler geometries and a very small um, numerical cost. LES will, of course, contain unsteady flow features, and it'll have a reduced modeling impact relative to RANDs because LES is generally seen as more as a higher fidelity simulation. Of course, DNS will really have no other you know, drawbacks because it's not making any direct assumptions. It's directly modeling, of course, all the scales of turbulence. The drawbacks of RANDs means you're only going to mean flow in statistics, and you have modeling closures. LES also has modeling closures, but it has an increased cost relative to RANDs. But you'll still need closure models for subgrid scale models. You also have to do all your simulations in 3D, and it has to be a very high order of accuracy code and contain all the reaction rates and coefficients. DNS is very costly, if not too costly, to do any type of industrial flow, and it's only limited to academic research problems. On the right, Poinsot shows two caricatures of the particular flows. Here's the temperature variation with, say, time. The black line might be the LES, the RANDs might be the average value of the solution, and the DNS is the actual fluctuating value. This gives you a temporal visualization of the power of DNS, LES, and RANDs, which we've talked about extensively in this class. In the lower right, you show how the energy spectra is divided. We talked about this in the turbulence part of the class, too. Here's your typical energy spectrum. The whole spectrum would be modeled in RANDs, the, or the whole spectrum might be computed and known by DNS, as shown in the upper figure. LES will only time resolve the lower wave numbers or large scale turbulence structures and model the higher wave numbers. So these are your choices when doing CFD or CFD of reacting flow or if that is combustion. So we've went through and looked at Poinsot's formulation and here is his basic outline of the equations being solved. We have a conservation of mass, species equations for mass fraction yk. If the Hirschfelder Curtis approximation, we have this form in the equation, which is usually solved. We have the momentum equation, which is a modification of the original navier stokes equations with the extra term of rho times the mass fraction with a body force on it. And we have a much more complicated energy equation, which of course counts for the reaction rates and the mass fractions. So the original Navier-Stokes equations are hardly at all modified except for these particular extra terms which I just pointed out in the original equations. Go back to the fluid dynamics class where we talked at length about the derivation and if you see you have a DNS solver it's very easy to change it into a reaction rate or reaction combustion solver by simply adding in these particular terms in the equations of motion and also of course accounting for the heat release of particular reaction heat transfer rate modifications with its particular mass fraction. Otherwise they're exactly the same set of equations. The challenge is of course is knowing what the mass fractions are and the enthalpies of all these formation of each species. This is all done and usually found from someone in uh, like a reaction or combustion chemistry field. They do very carefully controlled experiments to find these values and they're usually loaded in as tables into the CFD solver when it starts. So in practice, if you're a practicing engineer in combustion, this approach is pretty straightforward because you're only loading in these particular tables of chemical values and the reaction rate coefficients. And this slide, uh, which is a little bit warped because it's a poor photocopy of a particular page of Poinsot's book, shows the enthalpy and energy forms of all the particular equations. So for the energy equation, we could solve for any of these forms. We could do it for energies or enthalpies. And we can really only choose one. Nonetheless, some of them have additional assumptions in them. So we could change, for example, any of these types of forms in the energy equation. It's totally up to you. And there would be disadvantages and advantages of choosing different energy equations. You can see how deep this field is, and the choice of this can have tremendous effects on your results and your way forward. In theory, of course, they should all pretty much give you the same result. I mean, on a ballpark level. But nonetheless, they'll have certain specific implications you'll have to really study a class in combustion 
combustion chemistry and specialized classes in CFD or reacting flow to truly understand this entire field. You can also look at particular reductions of these equations. Perhaps if we have a combustion flow or reacting flow where the flow is deflagrating, that means it is in a deflagration flow, meaning it's not detonating, that there's no particular detonation of the flow. This is the type of combustion we would prefer in a particular type of engine. We don't want our reaction or our flow to detonate inside of an engine. That basically means it's an explosion. There's very few propulsion devices where we want an explosion to happen. Nonetheless, we want things to just progress in a nice orderly manner without some detonation wave coming out of the flow. This is your typical type of reaction in a combustion chamber. If we're only looking at deflagration at constant pressure, our whole set of equations of motion simplifies even more as the form shown on this particular page of Poinsot's book. We can also look at particular RANS models for combustion. So if you go back and review RANS modeling, which we've talked about in this class in the Reynolds averaging approach combined with Fabry averaging, we can now perform those operations on the chemical species or equation for mass fraction. So remember why k is mass fraction, the tilde will be a Favre average and the bar will be a Rand's average. We can also apply the same averaging technique to the new energy equation. For example, we might do it to the enthalpy equation. Take a minute to look at these equations and look in your notes of how they differ to our Rand's and Favre average forms of the equations, uh, which is a few classes ago now. These are pretty much identical to the original FANS equations, Favre average and average Stokes equations, but without the chemical reactions. You'll see that now we have some new closure coefficients which are identified at the bottom of this page. For example, one is the mean density times the fluctuation of the Favre average of velocity with the fluctuation of the Favre average of each mass fraction. We might model this with this so-called gradient assumption, where we have an eddy viscosity, the Schmidt number for each species K, and of course the gradient of the mass Fabry average mass fraction. Another particular closure is shown here. We would also have to model the RANS average of each reaction rate omega sub K. So you can see it's even more complicated to create RANS closures for these particular models. Let's look at a few simple examples from the work of Poinsot and his contemporaries. And I have to just really plug his book again. It's a brilliant book. And when I found it, I read it cover to cover. Um, I really recommend it. And you can order it directly from um, a French company who publishes it on behalf of Poinsot. Nonetheless, we will now look at a small scale gas turbine burner. And this is typically where a cold flow field with swirl as well as reacting flow fields are going to be burnt in comparative experiments. This is one of the most widely used experiments to benchmark particular CFD solvers since 2005. So now a swirling flow will be injected into the injector and methane will be injected into that flow with little holes in the chamber. So what happens is the airflow comes in, there's a plenum, and there's a swirler, and the air is swirled, which of course contains the oxygen for the reaction. And in this chamber, they are injecting the methane. Why do they put in a swirl? Well, a swirling flow creates a stable reacting flow. Without a swirler, this flow may be unstable, and there could be instabilities, which could cause the combustion chamber to, of course, um, maybe extinguish the flame or worse, detonate and blow up the combustion chamber. And so combustion instability is an extremely important topic, which I'm a little bit passionate about. So it's fun to look at this problem from that standpoint. On the right, you see particular measurement planes, uh, values of X at different millimeters. Let's look at those planes and the combination between an experimental technique called LDB, which is in circles and lines from the large eddy simulation of the non-reacting flow. So this is just LES compared to experiments of these particular quantities at these five locations downstream from the face of the swirler entering the combustion chamber itself. You can see in these cases for velocities on the x-axis and the y-axis is positioned spatially across the react 
the ion combustion chamber, we'll have particular comparisons between the experiment and LES. You can see generally with very good predictions downstream, but very close to the swirl, there's some minor changes or, or you know, we're predicting zero velocity, but the experiment measures a small swirl in downstream velocity. Here's another case of the RMS values of the axial velocity, right? So this is the turbulence statistics. It's the root mean square of the axial velocity compared to the LDV experiment. It's non-reacting. Here's another comparison. This is the average tangential velocity profile between the LES and the LDV experiment in the swirling combustion chamber. Still pretty good results, but downstream there's a little bit of a divergence between prediction experiment. Now before we get into looking at the reacting flow comparisons, let's visualize the flow from the particular experiment. Here the flow is coming in from the left and it goes through the swirler and it exits here and it enters the combustion chamber. We will be injecting of course the fuel into this flow now and to see what happens. So this is the three-dimensional LES and results and you can see Q criterion essentially Oh, excuse me, isosurface or low pressures entering the flow field here. So this is the swirl within the combustion chamber here that you're seeing. And it's a very complicated three-dimensional flow solved, of course, with an unsteady scheme. Now, let's try and have a reaction. We'll have now an equivalence ratio of 0 0.775. The air will enter at 12 grams per second, and this creates a thermal power of 27 kilowatts, which is a lot. It's a stable flow. We're going to look at the stable flow first. Unfortunately, with this particular situation, there's no true comparison with experiments. Why? Because we are not able to measure the particular temperatures. This is a subject of active experimental research. It's very difficult to measure fluctuating temperatures in a reacting flow. So all we can find is the LDV measurements of the velocity field to validate our solver. Let's look at one particular example. Now we look at the examples of the reacting flow. From the left to right, again, we have axial positions of cross-stream plots of velocity. The x-axis are velocity and the y-axis are traces across the flow using LDV. You can see once again that we've generally captured the trends here with LES of our reacting swirling flow in the combustion chamber. These experiments are very expensive and difficult to do, and so is the LES of the reacting flow. We can now look at this reacting flow, the swirling chamber, along the axial direction. So along the centerline axis, we can look at the fluctuating pressure amplitude, which is extracted from the LES, and a particular Helmholtz solver, which is another type of solver which we haven't discussed. We'll have the values through the plenum, through the swirler, and then this is the exit of the swirler into the combustion chamber and out into the exhaust. This is one case where, of course, we're looking at two particular solvers, which have rather good agreement. But the Helmholtz approach is much simplified. And In this class, we have just touched the basis, and I have not gone through extensively these slides in the interest of class time, so that you can see the basic modification of the Navier-Stokes equations with chemical reactions and reaction rates. We showed the most basic examples. We talked about the all-important equivalence ratio for combustion, which is something everybody should remember, even if they're not in the combustion field, because it affects so many of our lives. And we looked at flame classifications in the laminar and turbulent and premixed and non-premixed flames. And we showed one very basic example experiment that is used today to benchmark and see the validation of large eddy simulation solvers with reaction rates. This field is humongous, and people have spent their careers in each particular little area of it to make small advancements. Any type of major advancements in the field of combustion or CFD of reacting flows or CFD related to reacting flows and could have tremendous impacts on our society, and it's very important it's a very exciting field, and of course, in our own departments, we have people working in this field. I encourage you to go forward and take classes in reacting chemistry and combustion chemistry to gain further insights into this beautiful mathematics and physics of fluid dynamics. Thank you very much for your time today. I'm Professor Steve Miller.